my life fades, the vision dims, all that remains are movie views. I remember a time of chaos, ruined dreams, this wasted land. But most of all, I remember a critic, the man we call Adam, a man haunted by the demons of his past. A man who wandered into the wasteland, and it was here, in this blighted place, that he learned to feud again. I like Tom Hardy. I think he's a terrifically ranged actor. Do I think he did a better job as Mad Max than Mel Gibson? No, not in the slightest. Tom certainly looked the part of the young Gibson, but he didn't give off the same vibes. That and his voice was all over the place, a few times going straight up Bane mode. It doesn't help that he had a goddamn mask on for most of the movie again. You know, hope is a mistake. If you can't fix what's broken, you'll go insane. The real star of Fury Road is Charlize Theron. She's a strong, badass female lead that has a major score to settle with Immortal Joe. There's a good looking string of ladies here too, from Lenny Kravitz's daughter Zoe to the blonde bombshell from T3. She's not annoying here though like she was in that other film, probably because this has a competent director. Last but not least is Nicholas Holt as Nux, a war boy in Immortal Joe's army of idiots. I only know Holt from X-Men Origins as Beast and he didn't really impress me there. It's hard to go up against Kelsey Grammer's previous run though at the character, but here he's on the other end of the spectrum. He really shows his range as an actor and I really liked him. He won my heart and my penis. Road Warrior has a string of supporting roles, but none of them are on the same level as Fury Road, except for maybe the assless chaps wearing mohawk, rocking, wristband shooting, psychopath Wes, played by Vernon Wells. This guy was a lot of fun to watch due to his reckless nature and once more, assless pants. Bruce Spence plays the gyro captain of a helicopter that just won't quit. Occasionally he'll drop a snake on an unsuspecting henchman, but his teeth are the real sight to be seen. Naturally Baby Spice can't take her eyes off him. There's also a young, boomerang throwing feral kid who could have used some more scream time if you ask me. I would have liked to know more about his backstory, but the same could be said for pretty much everybody in the community. The S&M mask wearing baddie known as the Humongous calls his men dogs and treats them as such keeping them at bay by chains if needed. Immortal Joe is even more vicious, treating the women of the wasteland as his property as cattle, using them for nothing more than their bodies as vessels for babies and milk supply, much like a typical member of the Duggar family. On the surface it's paper thin, but both these stories have more plot than meets the eye. The lack of dialogue forces the viewer to draw upon the visuals and subtle touches brought forth in the cinematography, in Road Warrior Max is much more weathered than the end of the first installment. He has a dog companion to keep him from going insane. He wants to be a recluse, but he can't fully commit to it because he's not fully gone yet. As much as he tries, trouble falls at his feet and our reluctant hero has to save the day the only way he knows how, by putting his life on the line. This same drifter shows up years later in Fury Road, now much more detached from everybody else. He's having visions of the people he's lost and disappointed over the years, such as his wife and kids. I have these visions already on a daily basis, and my, my family's still alive, but I'm dead to them. I'm dead to them. The only thing he has going for him is that awesome vehicle, the Interceptor, which he inexplicably never fucking drives. This thing is taken out not three minutes into the movie. Max is imprisoned and uses a living blood bag. It's not until Furiosa shows up and saves him that things really start to kick into high gear. Richard gear. Max reluctantly joins the cause, but eventually grows to love these people he's with, showing that there is still a shred of hope left in him. There's still a soul somewhere in there. Pray that he's still out there. The action and effects are the reasons to see a Mad Max movie. Yes, The Road Warrior has aged quite a lot since its 1981 showing. There are still some terrific stunts to be had, but honestly, looking back recently, there's nothing that holds a candle to Furiosa Road. The stunt work is nothing short of incredible, and more importantly, it's real men and women doing real stunt work. There is plenty of CGI at play, but it takes the Game of Thrones approach, using it for practical things like painting and backgrounds and additional character placement. There are some violent and intense scenes in Road Warrior that have stayed with me all these years later, such as the rape that's shot from a distance and our protagonist is helpless to even save this woman, watching instead through the binoculars as the horror unfolds. 
There's some great car stunts, flips, dismembered body parts, especially from the boomerang kid taking out the guy's fingers. And then there's the twist at the end with the oil tanker being full of sand. Sandstorms, a rock and roll vehicle complete with a drum line, a one-armed female badass, an albino army that worships cars, not to be confused with a Fast and the Furious fan, make this an insane and intense ride that I could watch over and over again. I've already seen Mad Max Fury Road twice. I look forward to seeing it like 20 more times when it hits DVD, Blu-ray, digital. Now I'm sure the same could have been said about the 80s counterpart, but things have changed a bit in the last 35 years. We expect bigger stunts, bigger visuals, bigger bad guys, and bigger sounds, which is a nice transition to our final round. Let's go. Blah. Great music can turn a mundane movie into something special. Fortunately, Road Warrior was already fantastic, so the score made it even better. Brian May returned to the sequel and brought with him a much larger array of instruments. Big orchestrational numbers were put into play complete with booming cellos and bass sounds. Physical sounds don't match that though. The feral kid throwing his boomerang sounds like something out of Looney Tunes. Wile E. Coyote getting something out of his arsenal. Miller switched it up for Fury Road and turned to Junkie XL to score the new installment. Nothing screams credibility quite like the name Junkie XL. The movie's a goddamn madhouse and the music reflects that with screaming guitars, pummeling drums, and an all-around frantic sound that keeps you on the edge of your seat from beginning to end. Mad Max Fury Road is a kick in the vagina Hollywood desperately needed, and coming out not too long after John Wick is a good sign of things to come, especially when both movies already have sequels announced. Much like the settings of the movie, Hollywood itself has turned into a wasteland of reboots, prequels, and bookended sequels that serve no purpose. Yes, Mad Max itself is a sequel, but it's one with passion and soul, a solid script, and you can tell there was a lot of energy put into it. It's got fire in its belly. Something that's just been missing lately, where everything else feels like it's put off of an expensive conveyor belt with $200 million budgets and nothing else to its name. Let me know your thoughts on these two flicks in the comments and vote for the winner. Please check out Feud Nation on Patreon to get further show ideas funded. After all, I'm just trying to find my place in this vast dumping ground simply known as YouTube. Max and I were not all that different. I mean, besides the smoldering good looks, devil may care attitude, physical stature, heroic nature, we're, we're basically the same person. More than just reviews, this is Movie Feuds. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. Witness me!